So let me just give you a, a brief introduction. Uh, Hodler Nort, as you all know, Bitcoin Maxi from uh, way back. He's been around for a long time and um, he has been going through quite the battle for almost five years now since 2019. And we seem to be reaching a particularly interesting juncture in this fight of his versus someone claiming to be um, Satoshi. So, Hodler Nort, welcome to the spaces. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dachi. Happy to be here. Absolutely. So, um, look, I guess I, I want to take it back to uh, a point in time when this all kicked off, because, you know, to give some people a, a bit of a background, I'm, I consider myself to be relatively new to Bitcoin. I, even though I was, you know, quite aware of it from very early on, I didn't actually put much money into it or any money into it until around about mid to late 2020, which was about a year after this all kicked off for you. So, I guess, um, you know, I've, I've caught the sort of back end of this um, when the fight was really um, coming to a head both in Norway and uh, the UK with the court cases. And so I, I'm mindful that I guess quite a number of our listeners have probably joined the Bitcoin community on Twitter sometime after I did as well. So let's give them, you know, a little bit of a background as to what the hell happened Um I, I first heard of Craig uh, Wright um, some years before your court case. So what happened in 2019 that led to the, uh, I guess, the, the lawsuits? Um, what, what was happening there? Can you give us a sort of insight into, into uh, that time in, in the Bitcoin space? Yeah, I'll do my best. Uh, I think we have to, like the backdrop, uh, I mean, Craig, Craig first entered uh, the scene, so to say, in 2015, uh, when a couple of big magazines, uh, Wired, Gizmodo, a couple others too, I think, uh, supposedly got this uh, anonymous uh, tip that uh, uh, Satoshi is now, we know who Satoshi is, like uh, basically supposedly doxing Craig Wright as Satoshi. Uh, turns out uh, <laughs> this was not some anonymous doxer. This was like an organized attempt to try to uh, unveil Craig Wright as Satoshi by by his uh, basically the people who owns his IP. Um, it was quickly debunked uh, because the documents uh, that were supplied to Ward and Gizmodo were forgeries. They were not uh, legit documents. So both publications kind of backtracked on this claim pretty fast a couple of days later. So it was just a huge farce. And that was uh, the start of this fake Toshi moniker. A lot of big, uh, big names in the industry called him out harshly, you know, uh, including Vitalik Buterin and Charlie Lee, the Litecoin creator. Basically all the big names in the space immediately recognized this for what it was. Uh, then in 2016, he uh, like uh, big news broke uh, when he had supposedly done uh, private uh, signings from the uh, early uh, Satoshi blocks, block nine, I think it was, in private with the former uh, uh, Bitcoin core developer Gavin Andresen and uh, a man named John Matonis, who was then the head of. Uh, the Bitcoin Association, which was uh, never a very legitimate association. They had uh, been invited to London and in a closed room with Craig Wright, he had uh, done a, a private signing for them on his computer. And Gavin Andresen followed up with making a blog post where he basically said, uh, Craig Wright is Satoshi. And there was uh, a lot of uh, immediate uh, uproar in the community. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone believed it. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, quite predictable, uh, it was quickly, once again, you know, shown that these signings were not very legit. And uh, Gavin and Raisin had to like backtrack and come up with a statement that he had somehow been bamboozled uh, and so on. So, you know, the, the, the outcry on social media calling Craig 
fake Toshi and you know uh, people were angry because I think a lot of people kind of look at Satoshi as a I don't know I mean at the very least a very very important person with a the creator of Bitcoin. I mean, uh, Bitcoin means a lot to many people. So to have a person trying to take that crown is pretty provocative. Um, then we fast forward to, I mean, what happened in 2017 was that uh, Bitcoin Cash forked off from uh, from Bitcoin, uh, and Craig Wright soon joined uh, Roger Ware in Bitcoin Cash. Then they had a falling out. Uh, I mean, he joined Bitcoin Cash as supposedly being Satoshi. Roger Ware famously wore a T-shirt uh, uh, somehow saying that, uh, you know, Craig is Satoshi and posted on pictures with him and, and so on. A lot of people were annoyed at this. A lot of people were tweeting <laughs> the facts of this matter, uh, saying that they were of the opinion that Craig Wright was a fraud and so on. I was one of those people, um, and uh, in I mean, BSV became a thing uh, in December 2018 when they forked off from Bitcoin Cash because uh, Craig had uh, alienated himself with the Bitcoin Cash uh, gang. Uh, then in early 2019, I happened to start uh, something that was dubbed uh, the Lightning Torch, which became pretty viral in the Bitcoin community, got a lot of media attention and kind of showcased the capability of the Lightning Network. And while this uh, torch was running, it was running uh, January, February, March, and even April 2019. While this was running, uh, Craig was like increasingly uh, standing up saying, I am Satoshi. I will sue anyone saying I am not Satoshi. And uh, as a Norwegian citizen uh, and a free speaker, uh, I tend to speak my mind. I uh, I told in very uncertain terms what I thought he was, which was not Satoshi, but something very different. Um, and uh, they decided to make a target out of me. So in March uh, 2019, uh, I get a DM from a UK law firm demanding that I immediately tell them who I am, my real identity, and that I show up in court to basically testify that uh, I was wrong and that uh, Craig Wright is Satoshi. Can I just um, interrupt yeah, you sure. for a second? Um, can you just tell us a little bit about um, the motivation and intent behind targeting you? So they obviously wanted to go the legal route, but I remember reading something from Calvin about what they wanted to specifically achieve by targeting one person that was high profile in particular. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird, you know, I, I wasn't really high profile. I had been uh, gotten some kind of <laughs> reputation through this lightning torch, but I think I had around six, 7,000 followers or something on Twitter. I was not the big voice. But that, that wasn't a small account back then. I mean, the biggest accounts back then, I think, well, in 2020, when I entered the space, like Peter McCormack probably had 60,000 yeah. and he was one of the most high profile. Yeah. So anyone with a few thousand, the community, what, what I'm trying to say is the community was much smaller. Yeah, back but then. I was still not yeah. anywhere near the biggest uh, still crypto or Bitcoin account, but that, that, that doesn't really matter. I think, I mean, obviously yeah. they wanted to chill speech on this uh, topic and they wanted to make an example out of someone. They wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, either bankrupt uh, this person or have them you know crawl to the cross and uh, kiss Craig's ring and as I said I was not given any outs my only out was to kind of join their narrative that Craig is Satoshi and uh, I couldn't do that obviously mm. so uh, yeah should I just continue on that yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. yeah so this was 29th of March uh, I, uh, I basically, I, I mean, I obviously had to contact uh, lawyers and ask, <laughs> because initially I, I live in Norway and we are covered by extremely good free speech laws here. Uh, so I, I initially thought this was just like laughable uh, that I could be sued from England 
as a Norwegian for saying something obvious. But it turns out Norway had signed a convention with the UK called the Lugano Convention, which uh, means that any judgment in either jurisdiction will be enforceable in the other jurisdiction. So basically, they could take me to court in London and I would, you know, they could enforce the judgment uh, made there in Norway against my assets here. And libel law, it was not like a coincidence they sued people from London because UK libel law is uh, absolutely notorious for uh, being like opposite of other jurisdictions. Uh, so if I go to court against Craig in London, I it, the burden is on me to prove that he is not Satoshi. And I probably couldn't prove that anyone listening to this space is not Satoshi. Uh, so this is why they chose that jurisdiction. So my legal legal people I talked to, they said that, uh, yeah, this is potentially a problem. Uh, but, I mean, they don't know who you are. So I kind of decided to hope they wouldn't find me uh, and continued on as usual. And then uh, I woke up on the 11th of April in 2019 to like my inbox was flooded. Uh, and there was an article in CoinGeek magazine, which is the publication of Calvin Air, like a BSV. I call it a propaganda blog. And they had published uh, a bounty on my identity, uh, promising $5,000 to the person who could provide information leading to my doxing. Uh, and that basically kicked off a witch hunt for my identity uh, here in Norway. Uh, and yeah, people were on the streets, you know, photographing the, I had left some tracks in my tweets of pubs I had been to. They were kind of like investigating office spaces they thought I could be. They were looking through pictures of, of conferences because this bounty article had published images that showed some of my tattoos. So they explicitly asked people to go specific places and look for someone with these tattoos. Uh, they knew I was going to Baltic Honey Badger, so they said, yeah, you should go there, look for look for this person. So it, it was pretty bad, uh, and I deactivated my Twitter account at that point. So did, at that point, had they hired um, private investigators, or was this more of a call um, like out to people to sort of outsource your yeah. doxing? Uh, unbeknownst to me, they had also already hired private investigators. Uh, and I have only recently found out that they have also hired a very sophisticated uh, private intelligence company called Diligence that has been surveilling me both digitally and physically for these years. And, you know, providing, uh, I think it's weekly uh, reports on all my activity physically and digitally. They've been following me to conferences. Uh, they've been trying to befriend my friends. They've been surveilling my house, stuff like that. This is after they found me, of course, because it wasn't until May 19 that I received a phone call from what turned out to be a Norwegian private investigator. Uh, and the, the day before, I had gotten a phone call from the office lady at the school I worked, and she told me that uh, a policeman had called her and uh, asked uh, if I worked there and that he needed all the information the school had on me. Uh, and it turned out this was actually the private investigator posing as a police officer. So he called me the day after. He had then gotten my phone number and my address. And he said, you know, I have some papers we need you to sign to. He didn't say what it was. I just said, I, <laughs> I don't think I'm very interested in signing any papers. Uh, he followed up with saying that, uh, uh, these are people you don't want to mess with. I highly suggest that you sign these papers, basically threatening me. Uh, a daughter was in the car, and this was on the car speaker, so that, that made me really angry. Uh, and then on, on advice from my lawyers, I, uh, I signed the papers because we knew they knew that it was me, and it was, it was not, no point in... I mean, the game was on, then the legal game was on. The thing is, we had already prepared for this eventuality. So we were ready to file a countersuit in Norway 
to get the jurisdiction to Norway, who has a much more sane libel law. So we, we filed a case against Craig to basically get a declaration that I was not, that my tweets were covered by freedom of speech in Norway. So we filed that uh, late May 19. Hmm. Were, were there any um, were there any consequences to the private investigator misrepresenting himself as a police <clears throat> officer? No, uh, it's very hard to prove anything. I mean, it's been this has been uh, publicized in newspapers in Norway since, and this investigator has been interviewed. I mean, he has apologized to me in uh, in the newspapers. He has not like admitted that he posed as a police officer, uh, but uh, no, there will not be any consequences for that. Wow. Okay. And so they're, they're, did they have um, separate legal strategies in Norway and the UK? What was their line of attack? In, in yeah. Each? I mean, the moment we signed, uh, we filed against him in Norway, that was, of course, like very unexpected for Craig Wright. Uh, and it kind of rug pulled their whole strategy because suddenly the jurisdiction is now in Norway. Uh, and you can't file the same case in the UK. Unfortunately, they are, in my opinion, very shameless people. So they still filed against me in the UK a month later, uh, received like 100 pages uh, long uh, suit in my mailbox. Uh, and uh, where their lawyers had crossed off like one of the things they have to state is that this matter is not currently like uh, running in this jurisdiction or any jurisdiction with agreements. Uh, so I, I, in my opinion, that was a lie. Uh, they filed in the UK. Uh, we immediately filed in the UK to have that case dismissed since uh, we already have a case in Norway. Uh, and then early 2020, the UK case was dismissed. But Craig obviously appealed it. And this is like the story of this thing that he will appeal anything because the strategy is first and foremost to break people either mentally or financially. Um, and he also, you know, appealed to have the Norwegian case thrown out. Uh, he appealed and appealed and appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court in Norway. So it wasn't until late 2020 that the Norwegian Supreme Court uh, ruled that the Norwegian case will go forward in Norway. Oh, okay. So it had to go all the way up yeah. to that level. And then, okay. and then uh, mm. like, I should maybe also mention that, I mean, when he started this against me in 19, I had just, uh, my dad had just fallen ill with very serious cancer uh, so i was you know having a lot on my table on the private front as well and uh, uh like my dad's disease and all of this legal shit was heating up uh uh until late 2020 when my dad died and the pretty soon after my dad died uh i found out that craig <laughs> actually won an appeal in the uk to have hit the uk case actually go ahead too uh, because they had they had argued some technicality that uh, you know the cases were different because there was a different number of tweets in in the in the UK case or something like that. It was it was ridiculous. And so you you're faced with an uphill well not an uphill battle but you know it's still any legal battle is going to be stressful upon you. Um, let alone when you've got the the passing of of your father that's um you know it's also an emotional toll on you yeah. as well um so uh, was there was there a point in law point of law that um he uh, was able to argue uh, in the uk that was to his advantage i would just say you know that law is in my opinion about technicalities and if you can if you have an endless amount of money to throw on lawyers you will probably be able to argue some of those, one of those technicalities, uh, or at least you have a good shot at it, even if you have a very bad case. And to like illustrate the, the asymmetry between our resources, when this finally went to trial in Norway, Craig was, 
I was sitting next to no less than 12 lawyers in the Norwegian court. Uh, he had law brought in several lawyer, lawyers from UK. He had a big team in Norway. He had some U, US lawyers present. He had just this, this host of, of lawyers around him. Um, and that helps, in a, unfortunately, in legal matters. So perhaps this is a good point um, to just to elaborate on, I guess, the adversaries and, and the funding. Craig was not, um, he was not self-funded. Where did he get his money from to, to pay for all of these lawyers? Yeah, I, I'll probably be a little careful in like stating things as fact here because, but I, I will say, you know, anyone can find this quite easily, I think. But it has been shown that, uh, I mean, Calvin Air is the guy who, funds the BSV ecosystem. That's no secret. He is the guy who owns the, this, this CoinGeek magazine that has been spewing all the libel and bounties and shit against me. And he has also been funding Craig uh, in court. I don't know if he has been funding everything, but he has been funding him. Uh, I do know that Craig himself, in my opinion, doesn't have anything. So, yeah. He's um yeah okay I, I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna ask the question but I I don't want you to answer that <laughs> I don't want to take you there um <laughs> so it's um yeah it's a bit of a tricky question I've just got Peter DMing me uh now in London CP wants to come um look this is um. It's an incredibly uh, distressing thing to go through, let alone when you know you've got uh, someone with nearly unlimited uh, resources to throw at you. I would say I would say unlimited resources, actually. Uh, Calvin Air is, uh, with all likelihood, a dollar billionaire. So, uh, and the, I think the estimates of what he has spent on the BSV ecosystem is probably somewhere around $500 million. This is my opinion, my estimate. And so you're facing uh, a guy that who you think is, um, and you know, I guess we all think that he's fraudulently represented himself as being Satoshi, and, and at the very least, he hasn't been able to prove that he is Satoshi. And so you're going through these court cases, and the judges end up uh, analyzing various documents that are put towards them. Um, what are their opinions on the documentation that Craig continually puts forward? Yeah, you know, uh, there has been a lot of tweets from Calvin Ayer and Craig himself and, you know, all the BSE uh, cult members about all the evidence Craig had, you know. We were told he had thousands of documents proving that he's Satoshi, the like early versions of the white paper with famously with coffee stains and rusty staples, one famous tweet. So they had been bragging about the documentary evidence for years. And when time came for trial in Norway, which uh, was supposed to go ahead in January 22, uh, we were served all of these documents that were supposed to prove Craig is Satoshi. And we were quickly able to debunk them as uh, forgeries. Uh, uh, every single document he provided, I think, uh, ridiculous uh, manipulations. And we had the KPMG. Uh, we spent a lot of money on that to have KPMG produce a very detailed report, Digital Forensics, proving that. Uh, so when we served Craig with the KPMG report, he uh, he accused us of having served him with tons of documents close to the trial. So he managed to get the trial delayed from January 22 to September 22. And then he had his own digital forensic uh, companies uh, look at the documents to try to, you know, uh, insert doubt. But unfortunately for him, they came to the same conclusions as, KP <coughs> as KPMG, that they were not uh, authentic documents. So we should make it clear, these were not subjective assessments that the documents were fraudulent but there were objective facts 
about the properties of the documents that made them incontrovertibly manipulated. <laughs> Not yeah. authentic, not, shall not, we say. Not, not what authentic. they were presented to be. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. funnily or uh, mysteriously enough, Craig, uh, Craig's Norwegian law, law firm uh, uh, excused themselves after having seen this KPMG report, and uh, Craig found a new law firm in Norway. And the new strategy when we went to trial in September 22 was that uh, documents don't matter. It's only about witness testimony. So he had now produced like a host of witnesses that were supposed to testify uh, on his satoshiness. And he, so he brought, you know, his business partner, his nephew, a couple of obscure supposed former friends. Uh, none of them said he was Satoshi apart from his business partner, actually. Uh, he said that uh, he really, really said that he was Satoshi, but the other people basically said something like, he's so extremely brilliant and intelligent that he must be Satoshi. That was the gist of the testimony from the other people. Uh, and it looked like Craig was really enjoying listening to his own witnesses on that topic. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. He He does come across as the sort of person who would. Um, so, you know, the, okay. We're, we're, yeah, like I said, we're not talking about subjective assessments about these documentations. I mean, there, was, there was an example that was given, I think, last week where he claimed to have produced a document or created the document initially in a software that, that wasn't yet available at that particular time. Yeah. I mean, what's happening in COPA now is, uh, I think it's unprecedented in, uh, in history basically. And I think the upcoming COPA case, if Craig shows, I strongly suspect he will find an excuse to not show. But if he shows, that is going to be uh, quite the show. Uh, so I have huge uh, stores of popcorn ready for this trial. It's going to last for a while. So you, you've had um, two cases uh, put against you by, by Craig Wright, one in Norway, one in the UK. And there's a COPA case that you've just... Uh, mentioned now that's in the uk yes, is it? that's in the uk can you tell us a little bit about that who, who is copa uh, what is their significance and what is their case in yeah. this instance uh, during the last years craig has escalated this lawfare uh, quite extensively he has uh, sued uh, like 20 i think it is bitcoin developers he has sued coinbase and kraken uh, for selling bitcoin as btc and not as bsv which is the real bitcoin according to craig he has sued uh, the owner of Bitcoin.org for copyright infringement on the white paper. So he has actually successfully managed to have the uh, the white paper unavailable in the UK because of this uh, lawfare. So COPA represents, uh, it's, it stands for Crypto Open Patent Alliance. And it has uh, people like Jack Dorsey, uh, Meta, uh, I don't even remember. A lot of the big players in Bitcoin are like funding it, and they have, mm -hmm. you know, came in as the cavalry, you know, taking the fight to Craig. So now in January, no, in uh, in the fifth of February, Craig uh, will go to court, uh, having to prove that he's Satoshi, and this time he uh, he has to prove it. The evidence, burden of evidence, is on him. He has to prove it this time. Why? Why is that? different in this instance compared to your cases? I mean, it's because this is actually a preliminary trial where the defendants in all these other cases Craig have started have because the, the judge in the UK has seen that all of these cases hinge on the same point and that point being is Craig Wright Satoshi and they also uh, extended it so there are three points that the judge is going to rule on is Craig Wright Satoshi? Uh, I think one, the other point is, is he the copyright holder of the Bitcoin white paper? And also whether or not he has fraudulently advanced his cases. So we will actually get a judgment uh, saying whether or not Craig Wright is a fraud. Wow. Okay. All right. So that, that should be a relief. For you, well, would that judgment be admissible in Norway and the UK? I mean, it's obviously UK court, but would that be admissible in Norway? You know, uh, 
it, it will definitely be admissible as uh, it will not just outright end my cases, but you know, I have a very hard time seeing Craig having any route to victory against me with the judgment in the UK saying he is not Satoshi when all of this shit started because I was saying that he is not Satoshi. Yeah. Okay. And how, how far are we from, from that um, judgment from, from the court in the court? I think case? the case will run until late February, uh, maybe even early March. I don't remember exactly. And then, you know, how long it will take for a judge to reach his judgment and uh, announce it is very unclear. It could take a month. It could take six months. Uh, and then, you know, Craig might try to appeal. I suspect it will be very difficult to get an appeal on that judgment, but who knows? So I am, you know, just in the same mode and the same attitude as I've been for five years. I mean, this is not over. This is ongoing. I'm not uh, counting any victory at all yet, you know. Uh, uh, people have congratulated me, you know, finally it's over for you uh, so many times these last five years because we think when a person is, you know, totally exposed as having produced forgeries and lying, normally that would end it right there. But if people are absolutely shameless then, uh, and have all the money in the world behind them, then this can actually go on <laughs> as we have seen. Yeah, I've, I've I read um, court reports of um, some judges being really quite um, uh, admonishing uh, the evidence that was presented to them in some of the harshest terms I've seen, actually. Um, and you're right about the point about you know if you if you have no shame, then you're willing to actually do anything just to save a little bit of face. But it does seem to me that in this um, legal battle against the collective, which is COPA, that he if he does get that ruling against him, would that put an end to your cases or will you still have to see those through and then hopefully submit those uh, the, the, the COPA cases judgment uh, in your case? As yeah, well? I'm prepared to see everything through. So I don't, mm. as, I, as I mentioned, you know, there is no automatic dismissal of those cases, but uh, yeah, I'll take that when we get there. Uh, we will see if you know if there is money and will from Craig and his enablers to continue this, but uh, yeah, they can rest assured that I'm not quitting at least. Well, uh, you've mentioned their enablers, and we've kind of <laughs> there's been some uh, cracks in the ice on that front, and it seems like um, shall we say the rats are abandoning the ship. Can you give us a little bit of insight about what's happening in the background? We've spoken about. Um, uh, someone we suspect of funding Craig Wright and some of his missives on Twitter in that regard and perhaps some other people. As yeah, well. I mean, there was quite a, quite a happening uh, this... Uh, when did it start? Maybe it was October, somewhere around then. The CEO of N-Chain, N-Chain is the company where Craig Wright uh, enjoyed the title of chief scientist. Uh, they are like the entity that holds all of this bullshit patents they have spun up, completely worthless patents. Uh, and uh, the CEO there was called, uh, is called Kristen Ager Hansen. He's uh, like Norwegian Swedish guy. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, uh, he basically uh, became a whistleblower in October. He, he came out, he has said in very un uh, no uncertain terms that Craig Wright is a fraud, that he has seen man manipulation of documents. Uh, he has exposed uh, a lot of things from the inside of this organization. And uh, it was when he talked to Norwegian media that it came out this, that I have recently found out that, you know, very nefarious private intelligence company uh, is uh, has been working on me and is still working on me uh, to gather any and all intelligence on my activities. And so um, I, I guess I, I was <laughs> alluding to Kelvin's, um, um, I guess you could call it 
uh, Twitter eruptions where he's essential. Well, were they leaked documents? I'm not sure. Were they were they tweets? You'll have to refresh yeah. my memory because you know you're a lot closer to this than, than me. But essentially, what came out was information that suggested um, Calvin Air has pretty much had enough of Craig Wright <laughs> and is suggesting for him in order to save face in any way that that is possible. Um, yeah. Uh, and and it looks and it looks like he has essentially threatened to pull the the financial plug. Absolutely, Christ Nagelhansen leaked an email from uh, Calvin Air uh, to Craig Wright with I don't I think Kristen was on copy or something I don't remember how how that worked but uh, Calvin confirmed that this was a legitimate email. Uh, he later deleted the tweet confirming it, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it turned out to be a legit email. Uh, where he said that, you know, you're going to be completely torn apart in this lawsuit and you have to sign. You have to, you have to, there was, there was some talk about signing at Harvard, you know, signing the Satoshi with the Satoshi keys. And all of this, I mean, this is, this was talked about in court in Norway too, you know, it takes two minutes to sign a message from a Bitcoin address. So, yeah, and all of this. But um, also in, in the message, it said that, astonishingly, Calvin has not seen him sign any message from any kind of key, which, you know, obviously, obviously he hasn't done that because he's not, he's yeah. not Satoshi. But he's saying, I thought that it was a ploy on your part um, for some mm -hmm. legal reason. But if that's not a ploy, implying that he actually he actually does believe this guy <laughs> uh, it's you know which you know it just goes to show you know just because you're rich doesn't mean you're smart right yeah. <laughs> uh, which i was totally incredulous reading that that um he was essentially saying that i thought it was a legal ploy that he had not provide conclusive evidence of your identity as yeah. satoshi um, and if that's not a legal ploy, then perhaps you should reconsider everything that we're doing. And maybe I'd be better off spending my money um, on other things like mm. my heirs, mm. and like his children, for example. Yeah, he was not happy. He was really angry at Craig. And I, I mean, I can only imagine how many million dollars he has spent on legal costs and all of these complete legal disasters Craig has, has gone from. Hilariously, you know, they still claim that Craig won all his cases. I think that's pretty funny. They are... It's crazy to see the level of <laughs> level of straight up, you know, lying and making up reality that happens in that camp at the moment. I I am seeing that on a number of different fronts right now, where um, people, once they have made up their minds, they choose to shape um, facts to suit their narratives rather than what the facts have revealed in and of themselves. Um, Interesting. Okay, mate. Look, um, we've we've had Peter McCormack join us, and Peter has also <laughs> been on a very similar journey to yourself along the way as well. And um, and I just want to, I guess, before I uh, throw over to him, was there anything else you wanted to to say before we open up the the, the floor to Peter mm, as well? I think. Yeah. I mean, I think we could go into details on this stuff for probably. <clears throat> a couple of days straight, but uh, I think I kind of, I'm sure this was very overwhelming for the listeners and hard to like get a grasp on what has really happened here. But basically yeah. the short of it is that it's been five years straight of very, very serious harassment and threats, both on, you know, directly from Calvin Air on Twitter, in his CoinGeek magazine, uh, through legal letters with the explicit uh, goal of bankrupting me and uh destroying my life that's that that was yeah i don't think i i, I think it's um we, we should not underestimate the depths of anguish the persistent harassment the all-pervasive surveillance that you've had to uh endure for five years let alone you know for a few months that would be quite quite yeah. unbearable i think i, think I just want to um, end uh, i'm sure maybe i will chip in some more but i one thing I haven't mentioned, of course, is the, the support that I received from the community. And that's been probably, you know, what has carried me a lot. Uh, both, you know, that actually I was crowdfunded by the community to be able to defend myself. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, just all the moral support is, has been absolutely incredible. And I will never forget it. And 
one day I will definitely write a book about all of this. And uh, I hope I will remember every person who has supported me in that in that book because uh, that has brought that's the only thing that has brought a tear to my eye through these five years is when I have received, you know, all this overwhelming support. Yeah, thanks for that hard note. Peter, um, are you there? Yeah. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Peter, we just went through um, the background to what Hodlinort has been going through, including, you know, in the lead up to um, calling him out as, uh, as uh, shall we say, not Satoshi. <laughs> Can you tell us how you got involved in all of this? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, as, I might be careful with my words here because I do still live in the UK and, and uh, with my case essentially over. I don't want to enter another situation again. Um, but and and hodl and all, I'm going by memory, so correct me if I get any of this wrong. But uh, I remember when hodl and all was first calling him out, and then um, uh, he messaged me. Hodl and all messaged me when he uh, received the first uh, letter serving him up, uh, and so we discussed it. Um, he was like, wasn't sure what to do, so I said, "Well, fuck it, I'll call him out." You know, I've got a big profile with the podcast. Uh, I'll try and uh, bring attention to it. And my assumption being that um, if they wanted to litigate, they could litigate through me. And uh, hopefully then we'd, there would be some kind of substantial backing from the Bitcoin community, maybe a COPA kind of situation to, to help defend it. I mean, I was, it was quite naive uh, of me to do that because I didn't really understand litigation or libel litigation at the time and you know, not really think it through. I was like, yeah, fuck it. Yeah, I'll call him out. Is it, would you say that's about a fair summary of all that? Uh, you know, Peter, I don't even remember exactly how. I, I knew that. I know that we were in communication and, you know, uh, but when we talked, I don't remember anymore. I was just, you know, very happy to see that you kind of, you ended up pulling, you know, the laser eye of Sauron uh, away from me a little bit. Uh, even though, of course, it didn't end my my troubles, but, you know, just uh, the initial pressure was so intense. So I really appreciated it. That you did that yeah i mean I, 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 I mean i could go back and check the dms but i mean that, that's about what i remembered and it just felt a bit unfair that hodl and all because i think at the time i probably had like a few hundred thousand followers and i i think you were more in the, like the low tens of thousands i think like seven right? six seven or something around. yeah so I, I just thought fuck it like don't don't bully our space cat like if you want to have a go come come for someone with substance and i don't mean that like arrogantly i was just I felt like I could bring a wider attention to it. And so then eventually I got served and um, ended in uh, this five-year litigation, which I was not prepared for, had no idea. Yeah, can I just, can I just jump in, Peter? Because I, I just because I was curious myself, I looked at our DMs now, and what happened was that we were talking about speaking about the Lightning Torch, and then Oslo Freedom Forum was also just about to happen in Oslo. So we had been like talking about that. And suddenly then I got these legal letters and then I shared them with you and, you know, the rest happened. So it, you were pretty much spot on. Yeah. So I, I thought I would do it to kind of divert attention and, you know, not understand the litigation naively went into it. Um, yeah, it's all my own fault for doing it, let's be honest. But um but yeah, so I entered into this what has been five years of absolute hell, probably similar to, I think probably me and Hodl and are the only ones who truly understand what, what it's like to go through this because uh, you feel like someone is trying to destroy your life. You feel like somebody is coming at you with, the, the main the main pressure is, is really a cost pressure. So if, if I could put it a different way, if litigation was free, you know, and lawyers were free, I don't think this would have been hell because, because there's no cost pressure in it. The, the, all the pressure, I mean, I don't know if I was surveilled, and that itself is fucking weird, and, and you know, I feel for odd or not. I, I have no idea if I was. Perhaps I was or wasn't. But the, the primary pressure is cost because you're coming up against massive fees, you know, phone calls that cost you thousands, court appearances that cost you tens of thousands, uh, legal uh, uh, costs from your lawyers and your barristers that cost you hundreds of thousands. And 
you know, most of us are of kind of normal means, maybe done a little bit okay because of Bitcoin. But when you're facing costs of seven figures plus, that is very challenging. Throw into that that if you lose, you're subject to their costs, which runs into millions. It suddenly becomes very scary because you're facing the destruction of your income, your property, you know, everything really. Um, mm. And so that becomes one of the biggest the biggest pressures because because if you want to destroy someone's life, if you take away their ability to earn all their possessions and their home, it's a pretty fucking scary situation. But Peter, that, that wasn't just a theoretical threat for you, was it? You, you actually had to live through the financial pressure. You had to make adjustments to your own personal circumstances with your home and all the rest of that. Well, no, I, and, and I still am. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was, I, I was fortunate. I, I received, um, at the start, I received a, a donation from Tether. They uh, gave me $200,000 towards my legal costs. And so that kind of got me going. Um, uh, but I had to drop some, the, the costs were so high to defend on all four points because you can defend on truth, public interest, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was going to run into millions to defend that. And I didn't have those funds to do it. Um, I was kind of getting through this like by hook or crook, by you know taking the profits from the podcast and taking loans out, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of get through it. Um, but as we got close to trial, we were in two, within two months of trial, and my lawyers were very honest. They said, look, um, it, it looks like you're going to lose this. Um, you're probably going to lose this case. Um, uh, by, by the definition of the UK law, you you have libeled him, and without um, uh, without a defence of truth or public interest, uh, etc., the only thing you can defend yourself on is serious harm. But if he proves serious harm, you will lose, and if you lose, um, you're going to have your legal bill with us and his legal fees, which have, at that point were you know well over two million, perhaps three million. So, in total, I would I would be in for about five million. My total assets do not add up to that, so um, so therefore I'd have a problem. So I had to speak to the uh, my lawyers, RPC. I had to speak to their bankruptcy lawyers to discuss the process. So you can plan ahead of time, and essentially speaking, what would happen is you you would be forced to sell your assets. So one of the first things that would have been sold would have been my business uh, interest. So my shares in my podcast, so essentially my podcast, would have been forced sold on the market. Um, of which you never know, Calvin and Craig could have been a bidder. You know, usually when you sell something like that, the buyer has an expectation that you won't any longer be the host. So it's a fire sale. It gets sold for you know, pennies on the dollar. Um, and there's some discussion around what assets they can sell within your house. Like they, they can't sell your bed and your TV or whatever. There's certain things. And also, you, if you've got children, you can't be immediately have your house sold. You have a year to live in your house and find alternative accommodation then in the year your house will be sold but essentially over the space of a year all my assets wouldn't have sold and and because the assets wouldn't have uh, added up to the value of what i owed him i would have then been declared bankrupt which would have stopped me uh, being a director of a company for seven years and so yeah that was very stressful um yeah i remember that would have taken everything you had and removed your ability to earn your income through your podcast so yeah i would have had to have found a job and and you know somewhere to rent um, which I, you know, I probably could have done, but you know, essentially, you're what you're being wiped out. And as somebody who's, you know, at the time, I think I was 44, that the, the the idea of being wiped out is, you know, very scary. You know, you've got commitments. You know, I've got children who are in education. You've got, you know, lot. You've got, you've got a life, and it, essentially, the entire the entirety of your life are being wiped out. And um, and that's that's a scary situation. Uh, I remember, yeah, you know, I was in. Um, uh, Austin with Danny and we were you know we were in uh you know we've rented the Airbnb to do our usual sprinter shows and we were just trying to figure out is there any way out of this you know can I can we sell the podcast now ahead of time but if you sell it ahead of time then they'll claw that back so it was a really scary situation and then uh you know when I got back to the UK I actually ended up in hospital twice just from stress so I get these things called SVTs I think I've talked about it before but I had two stress induced SVTs where I had to go to hospital because I thought I was on a heart attack it was, fucking, it was horrible stuff um, uh, and then it was weird because I'd received this uh, I won't dox them it's quite a small account on Twitter that, that had messaged me and said by the way I don't think Craig 
uh, was um, rejected from those conferences that he said are part of his serious harm, you should look into that. So I did. I phoned up. I found all the organizers of every conference, phoned them up, and they all gave me different reasons why Craig wasn't there. But it was nothing to do with what he had claimed, which was my email. So they all became expert witnesses. And our strategy was to go in saying, look, we don't think Peter's caused serious harm. But if he has, as he's libeled, because Craig has run a defense for the last you know, three, four years, which is based on lies, we think he should be given a nominal judgment of one pound, which if you get that judgment, that means you become the successful party. Um, so, yeah, so at the very kind of last minute, we managed to turn a defeat into victory, which is a huge amount of relief. It demonstrates the perversion of the legal system in, in so many ways, Peter, that um, if you don't have the money, you can't even contest the facts of the case. Oh, the whole thing's fucked. I mean, it's it, the, the UK libel laws are known to be pathetic. And we've seen this with um, oligarchs uh, uh, opening libel cases against journalists in the UK. And so it has this chilling effect where people just are scared to write or report on certain subjects because you cannot have a sub £1 million libel lawsuit if someone chooses it not to be because it takes so long, which is why it's, you do need better free speech laws. You do need slap laws. But I'm, I mean, you know, my lawyer, Rupert, has been amazing. He, he's continued, he had an article in The Guardian discussing this, you know, referencing the case. You can, if you are rich, you can bully people into not saying things. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Man. I know, but listen, look, it all sounds like <coughs> doom or gloom. And, you know, it isn't great, but, you know, let's look at the positives. Um, people have held the line with this. They haven't folded. And it's been a long journey. And I think we're days away from it all being, like, the majority of it all being over. I personally do not see this trial going ahead. I do not see COPA happening in seven days. Why is that? Um, I think for two reasons. Um, uh, firstly... My personal view is I think Calvin knows exactly where they are and his actions now reflect his letter where he suddenly, you know, he's been very public in support of Craig, but the the offer of a settlement was a massive sign of weakness. They, I think that offer signaled they know they're done. So can you tell us a little bit about this? There wasn't, there was an offer that <laughs> you, uh, you, I think it was you or Copa replied to quite uh, emphatically. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, they. Both, I mean, I just saw it, and I was like, my first thought was like, well, if there is going to be a settlement offer, it needs to include myself and Hodler Nort. Um, we're both wrapped up in this. But then I was like, do you know what? Fuck him. We've got him this long. He's on the ropes. Just finish it. It's done. Let's let's just finish him. You know, no mercy. Look, I I empathise with people in certain legal situations, but the the choice the choice to go and try and use finances to destroy somebody's life and the impact that has not only on them but their children and their family that's a very serious act you know that itself is quite a violent act um and i have zero sympathy now so my view is no mercy like crush them um but but copa came out and said hard pass because the reality of the offer there's three parts of the offer that really stood out the first one was uh Craig essentially saying, I will give everyone the right to use my IP. Well, um, by accepting that offer, it's kind of like accepting it's his IP to give. So that's not great in itself. Uh, the second part was uh, no more media attacks. That implies people can no longer criticize in public. And there was a third part, I can't remember, but but they said hard pass. The offer was an absolute joke, you know. It's probably nothing more than a PR move, right? Well, I think it was quite a clever offer if, if you had stupid people on the <laughs> other end. You know, because it's like, oh, yeah, well, let's not waste any more costs. I mean, yeah, am I allowed? Oh, I don't know if my, my offer that was made to me, and I, I don't know if I'm allowed to make it public. I just do you, want to be do you, careful. Because I was, perhaps we can I just was talk being... about it in abstract terms, but do you, do you take, do you, just the fact that he made an offer, do you take that as some sort of concession? Uh. The fact that he's made an offer to Copa says to me they know exactly. So look, 
I think the way these things are structured are to ideally avoid trial, to get people to settle, to get it, keep it away from court, which is why everything becomes public beforehand, which is why you have to share all your evidence beforehand. There's no surprise evidence in court. Um, there was a time I, I yeah, there were, let me put it a different way. At various points in my lawsuit, there were settlement offers made. Um, but I'm just not sure if I'm allowed to discuss those publicly. So I'm not going to get myself in trouble because mm -hmm. I think they might be kind of like without prejudice. But, you know, you have to weigh them up. And um, certainly, uh, yeah, I, just, I don't know if I can say this. So I'm just not going to. You don't have to go into yeah. the details of anything. What I'm saying so I'm is. happy to keep it abstract. Yeah. What I'm saying is, if, you know, if you make an offer, it can be a sign of strength because you think you're ahead and you make a strong offer, which, you know, gives them an out. Or you may make a, you may you may be realizing the writings on the wall and you make an offer and it can come across as weakness. It's all all litigation is really a game. It's it's just a game to try and win. Yeah. You know, yeah. The only reason you, you go to court is because there's deadlock and you believe you're right. But ideally you you don't want to be in litigation. It takes time, energy, and money. Yeah. So what's your um What's your interpretation of uh, Coper's position right now, given that an offer has been made and that's been emphatically rejected? Um, you, don't, think, you don't think the case will go ahead, the court case will go ahead. What will that mean? Um, well, I don't know if it goes ahead, but I, I believe that Coper have a slam dunk here. Okay. I also, I also I believe and feel that judges uh, get a feel for a litigant and start to become aware of a litigant and start to be aware of the facts around a litigant. And to me, based on my experience of this, uh, of be, being uh, in litigation, is that they have, a, they have an absolute slam dunk here. Like, I don't see any scenario where Craig can win this lawsuit unless he turns up in court and signs the, the private keys. Um, you just have to look at the facts around how, what this case, this, this case is being judged on very very difficult for Craig to win this or I just don't see any scenario where he can uh, he also is at risk of um, further consequences for uh, continually submitting false evidence and yeah how, how does that not have consequences to date I well, mean well it, it, so the consequences come at the end um, uh, where you can be held in contempt or you can be charged with perjury and it comes down to like does the judge recommend it? Do the uh, CPS want to pursue it? You know, the CPS is busy. You can privately prosecute, and then the CPS might take it up. Again, mm -hmm. another complicated area. But uh, I, I think they have a slam dunk. I think uh, Shoesmiths, who are a very reputable law firm, also probably are looking at this thinking, I wouldn't be surprised if they're thinking of pulling, because if they do represent, they have to represent honestly, they can't, they can't represent their client very well at the moment because even their own expert witnesses have said these are, these are forgeries. And so I just don't, you know, I've also faced Craig in court and he, he's a terrible witness on the stand, in my opinion. He's so give, give us some details on that. What do you mean? Because I've got my personal opinions on how he comes across. What makes him a terrible witness uh, in the eyes of the judge and, and yourself? Well, this may, this, you know, this may go ahead. So, and, and I, but I, have, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's listening right now through one of his accounts. So, I'm not going to, I'm not going to arm him with why I think he's a terrible witness ahead of trial. We can do this again afterwards. But I just, I've I faced him off. I faced off against him, and it was like it was easy work. Um, I found defending myself quite easy because I only had to tell the truth about what. I'd been through him and my experience. And when you've always told the truth, you've only got one thing to remember, like what happened. So that was that, that it's very easy to defend yourself on the truth. Um, I think if you've spun a web, um, I think, and I'm speaking, you know, not about Craig, but I'm speaking about anyone who has to defend themselves, that becomes difficult because you're trying to perhaps remember contradictory items. And so it be becomes very difficult in court. It's, I mean, in court, being cross-examined, it can be very tough. You know, you can be up on the stand for you know, a whole day. It's tiring. It's 
and, and the person cross, uh, um, cross examining you is is trying to catch you out. But I, for me, it was very very simple because there's nothing to be caught out on it. I just told the truth the whole way through. Hmm. Mm. But but like I said, I just don't see this going ahead. I I I I, I see multiple scenarios. I see admission of defeat. I see disappearing. I see I see a, a, a settlement where it's basically uh, giving up on every. I, I see. I just do not f believe this trial will start because it's just it's, wasting money. Yeah. Well, it does seem that they have a lot of money to to waste, but um, perhaps uh, that's coming to the end of the road as well. And I just wonder if if it turns out as you um, as you expect, what does that mean um, for your costs, for Hodler North's costs, um, and does that mean do do you expect those cases to then fold, or what would you expect to happen? Well, my, mine's done. So all we have to figure, solve is costs. Um, unfortunately, I, I won't get the I won't be able to recover my um, uh, costs for the drop defenses, um, and that. So they, uh, my case essentially splits into to two elements: uh, before I dropped my defenses and afterwards. So I won't be able to recover my costs for my drop defenses, and. Um, uh, so therefore, it came down to the trial. As I was a successful party, he had to pay my costs. Um, but therefore, we're in the process. Of, norm, normally, the process now would be to go through a process of figuring out costs itself. In a five-year trial, it can take a year in itself, and probably ends up in front of cost judge. And and it might have ended up where it's a situation probably where we would have both just dropped hands and walked away, or one may have owed the other like. A hundred thousand or two hundred thousand. Now, if he loses Copa, I can possibly go and have um, the previous costs judgments overturned. Um, but I would have to spend money with my solicitors doing that, and and it probably does. But but in trying to recover my costs, I'm essentially chasing a ghost. Mm. So the most likely scenario is I, I will bear the burden of my costs, of which I think the total cost now is about one point three million pounds. Um, of, of which I have about seven hundred fifty thousand pounds. I still have to pay. Damn! So all this—it's uh, a win, but it's not really a win, is it? It just is what it is, right? You, I, you just have to become stoic about it. <laughs> Don't overthink it. So, I guess what what have you? What has helped you get through all of this then? Um. I don't know, that's a good question. Um, I mean, Danny, Danny's been a fucking legend for it. He, Danny he's, uh, is your your producer on yeah. what the what Bitcoin did podcast. Yeah, yeah, he's been good. But there's been a bunch of a bunch of people in the background. Again, I don't want to dox who's helped, but there's very prominent people who've been very helpful all the way through, and you know, and I, I thank them dearly. Um, uh, one person at one point uh, loaned me a significant amount of money so I could continue the case. Otherwise, I would have had to fold. And again, very grateful to that person. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough one. Mm. Um, and th th there was that one bad, very bad period, but the rest of the time, I, I don't know, I was just, I kind of always felt like it, the, you know, the truth would win. I kind of al always felt like, come on, this doesn't make sense. It, it, it's not really going to end up in this place. And, and so I, I don't know, I just, I just, I don't know, I can't, I can't answer that. I, I, I just, yeah, I don't know. There's no solid answer I can give you to that. You just just get on with it. It's a really interesting you, you say that because um, you know when I when I first met Hodler Nort um, uh, sometime last year, uh, yeah, um, the first thing I wanted to express was how much uh, I admired uh, him for battling through this. You know, uh, it's it's quite a significant burden for one person to carry. You know, in his case, um, and he he recently said to me, uh, I. Because I, I said to him, you know, they picked on the wrong guy. And he said, I, I wasn't sure I was the wrong guy, to be honest. And, you know, I could only say that no one really knows, do they? You don't really know that you've got that strength until you're tested. Yeah, it's a weird one. It's not like, I'm not going to pretend I'm like, oh, I'm really fucking brave. You know, I took on Craig Wright. I wasn't going to. Because it, it didn't work out like that. It was just a series of actions. Like, I called him out. And then I ended up in a lawsuit. And then about a year and a half later, I start to realize how much you know how deep this you know and how expensive this will be and 
you know, various points people have helped me in. I don't know, just almost like picked it off in chunks, just dealt with it in chunks. But there's no like, oh, I, I, I'm not going to pretend I was like some brave guy. There were times I was absolutely crapping myself. Um, yeah, and but bravery, other... bravery is not the absence of fear, is it? It's, uh... No, but it's just yeah. like, you know, it wasn't... I don't know. I didn't set out to to destroy Craig or anything. I just, you know, I just joined the situation when it when Hodlinort was being, you know, attacked and they were trying to dox him. And and just a series of events have happened over the last five years. If anything, probably what's helped is I've just been so distracted, so busy with the podcast, making films, you know, doing the football club. I've had enough distractions not to think about it too much because when you do think about it, that's when you you can go a little bit mental. Mm. You just persist, put one foot, foot in front of the other. Well, yeah. look, um, I want to thank you both for your um, your persistence in these battles. You know, I, I'm fairly new to Bitcoin, as I said at the start of um, this uh, interview. I sort of came into the community uh, as a lurker late 2020 as I invested funds into Bitcoin. And then when I started this account in uh, January 2021, so it's only been uh, three short years or so, and um, and I caught the back end pretty much of this when it was in full swing. And so I want to thank both of you guys um, for standing up and uh, on behalf of the community and uh, seeing this through. Hopefully we see it through to a successful conclusion um, and uh, setting a good example for us all, uh, actually. So thank you very much for coming on and uh you know telling us your stories and uh thank you very much for your for your um stoic bravery as well thank you archie yeah cheers man it's always a pleasure thanks guys and thank you to everyone for uh joining us this is going to be recorded and also posted on youtube as well until next time